I um, wanted to add on to the video that I did about the cost of SRT ownership. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to speak quickly and concisely. Um, and uh, the reason why I want to do that is because, you know, I've made other videos like where I went and uh, showed you the Jaguar um, uh, F-Pace. And I got people who argue with me about the difference between leasing and financing. And um, absolutely, I will not tolerate certain levels of uh, argument because this person who was arguing didn't have a point and they were trying to say oh yeah well you don't get out of the cost of depreciation by leasing uh, you still pay it it's still factored in that's not true and I'm going to explain as quickly and as easily why that's not true so the first uh, thing I want to do is pose to you the reason why I feel it makes more sense to lease a Jeep SRT to lease a Jeep Trackhawk or to lease a Hellcat, or to lease a Demon. I feel it makes more sense to lease one of these cars than I think it makes to finance them, and I'm going to explain why as quickly as possible. So uh, Jalopnik, on uh, December 16th, they did a, um, um, a, a small um, editorial where they were talking about the lease special that Dodge was offering for Hellcats. Now, first of all, there's a reason why they would rather lease these things than they would to finance them. And I'm going to explain why. Now, anybody who owns an SRT vehicle, you would recognize right away that SRTs depreciate very, very slowly. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to eBay. And we're just going to look up what is the cost on a 2006 or 2007 or even a 2008 Jeep SRT. Now, mind you, these cars were in the $55,000 range, close to $60,000 used. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to eBay and I'm going to type up 2006 SRT. In fact, I'm not even just going to put Jeep. Let's just put 2006 SRT. And I want you to see 2006, what do these things cost after thousands of miles of ownership? What do these things cost? I want you to see this. So a 2006 Viper, now mind you, a Viper is a special car, so I'm not going to count that. Still 42997 Jeep SRTs, 2006, twenty three dollars or $24,000. 2006 Jeep Grand Cherokee. As you can see, these things are going for about $20,000, and that's with thousands of miles on them. 2006 Dodge Charger. Now, mind you, we're in 2007 right now. 2007. Um, or 2006, these things are still $16,000. Look at the Chrysler 300, the SRT four-door sedans. These things are still $13,000. Let's see how many miles is on that. 106,000 miles. So the first thing you'd say to yourself is, well, why the fuck would somebody pay $13,000 for a used car with 106,000 miles? Look at this one right here, 2006. 10,000, look at that, 123,000 miles. And if you remember, I had a car exactly like this. In fact, that might be my car right there. I had a car like that. I had a 2006 Mineral Gray. So the first thing somebody would say, well, well, why the fuck would somebody pay that much money for a 2006 uh, Chrysler or Dodge product? What are they, crazy? Why would they pay that? I could get a 2006 Toyota Camry for $3,000. Yeah, well, there's a simple reason why nobody wants that shit. It's because these things, when they made these cars, when Mopar made these cars back in 2006, these things came with so much technology, it was ridiculous. My 2012 had almost the same amount of technology in it as a Mercedes S-Class. I had heated and cooled cup holders, panoramic moonroof. Yeah, it wasn't as high in quality, but then again, it cost half what a Mercedes S-Class cost. My car is $55,000, and I made a video where you saw me buy it brand new, and the Mercedes S-Class was one hundred and ten dollars to $120,000. So even a 2006 one of these damn things is $42,000 at 4 Viper, or $23,000 or $20,000 for Jeep. If I speed that number up, let's see what happens. Let's see if I go to 2012 SRT. I just type SRT because this way everything will just come right up. 2012 SRT. Look at the fucking prices on these things. $32,000 for a $55,000 car. And that's six years later. We're in 2017 while I'm making this video. Look at this. A black one like the 2012 I had. 
29,949. Let's see how many miles is on that. Let's see how many miles is on that bastard. Look at this. Look at this. 48,000 miles. So this thing is off warranty and people are still willing to pay that much. The book value for these things is still that much. Now, if you look at a 2006, now mind you, let's look at a 2006 S-Class. And there's a reason why I'm doing this. I'm going to explain it. Let's look at a 2006 S-5. Oh, you know what? In fact, I should say 2007 S-550 because that's when the W220, um, that's when the W221 that I had, that's about the time it came out. Now, that Mercedes, no, I'm not going to look at the limo because that's something totally different. But if you look at these Mercedes S class, a 2007 $110,000 car is now down to $22,985. And I'm pretty sure it's got thousands of miles on it. But the reason why I'm saying that is to say this these German cars depreciate faster than these American cars that have V8s that are four door sedans. And it's a very simple reason. The V8 engine that Chrysler FCA they currently have, that thing does not break down. It's like a truck engine. When I say like a truck engine, if you ever had problems with it, the only thing that you have to repair is maybe spark plugs or coil packs, possibly a water pump, maybe within 40,000 or 50,000 miles. But I don't even think that's a good estimate. Those engines are bulletproof. And the problem is because of the European regulations and these greener liberal uh, fascists that have tried to take over the United States government, because of these people... The price of a V8 is still high. So the price of a V8, people are willing to pay that much to get that kind of technology in their car because a naturally aspirated V8 has more torque and more horsepower in most cases than a twin turbo V6 does. Now granted, a twin turbo V6 gets better fuel economy, but if you're paying $60,000 for a car, nobody gives a fuck. So here's the thing that I wanted to do. I want to go to this... Um, loan calculator that I have. It's called Loan You Later. Um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um, it's called Loan You Later. I have it on here somewhere. Uh, I gotta push uh, search. It's on here somewhere. I don't know where I put it. Because what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you what it looks like uh, to calculate uh, loans. So give me loan you later. And it was made by this guy named Justin Hackwood. And it only has like nine reviews. And um, I didn't have it on my pad. So I had to actually download it just now. Once again, I haven't used this iPad in a little while. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through how it works real quick. Because it's really, really simple. But it's a great app. I suggest everybody okay, get it. Okay, so there it is. Loan you later. Now, let's think about what it costs to actually purchase, um, let's say a Dodge Charger. Dodge Charger has a loan amount of roughly $50,000. Now, some of you think that you can just buy a scat pack and that's going to be enough, but, you know, it's, it's really not. Now, as far as number of months, now, this is the kicker right here. What I've noticed is a lot of these dealerships have been giving you really low interest rates, but what they're doing is they're stretching out the number of months in order to make the loan easier for you to deal with. So let's say the typical loan period that they'll offer you is a 74 months. Now I've seen them go longer than that, but let's say it, when, when you use this loan calculator, you need three out of the four values. You need the loan amount, number of months, interest rate, or monthly payment. You only need three of these values. So let's say the monthly payment that I was paying for my Chrysler 300 is about $680. So let's say if the monthly payment was, let's say, six, no, in fact, let's say it was $550, right? That means the interest rate, oh, shit, I won't find it. Okay, let's say the interest rate, I'm going to cancel this. Let's say the interest rate on your 74-month $50,000 loan, let's say your interest rate was a 3. Let's say you had good credit. Your monthly payment is $740. By the time you finish paying that loan, it's $54,829. So that's assuming you bought, let's say, a Dodge Charger SRT. A Dodge Charger SRT. My Chrysler 300 was about $56,000. Actually, it was a little more, but I put some money down. The number of months that was on that loan, uh, that was a 72-month loan. And my interest rate was like a 
three, and the monthly payment is not eight fifty. So basically, I'm going to change that monthly payment to six eighty, so it'll give me the proper. Uh, won't it won't be able to go backwards? Okay, but anyway, I think you get the point. So let's take this up to Hellcat numbers. Seventy thousand dollars. What they'll try to do is put you on an eighty-six month. Some credit unions are willing to do that. And what happens is when you go to the dealer, they're willing to shop around so that they can find the absolute best rate that they can sell you that car. Now, the problem is the longer you keep the car, obviously, the more it depreciates. Now, here's the kicker, though. Hellcat depreciation, you'll probably never see one of those cars selling for anything less than about $30,000, even if it's 10 years from now. Because as I just showed you, a 2006 still goes for $30,000 or $20,000 in certain cases. So 86 months at, let's say that same 3%, everybody should download this as a great loan calculator. That comes out to $905. Now here's the problem though, and there's a very simple saying that I always repeat to people buying cars. You lease German and you buy Japanese. You lease German, you buy Japanese. Now why is that? Japanese cars, even though I complain that they're a bunch of boring, soulless, econo shit boxes, because they have so few parts in them, because they have nothing worthwhile in them at all, they're boring, but because they have so few parts, they actually last a very long time because there's not that much to repair. You lease German, you buy Japanese. If you finance a Japanese car, that means that more than likely you're keeping this car for a very, very long time. That's why when you look out on the street, you see these people riding around in these 93 Honda Accords and all this little garbage. But anyway, they don't break down because there's nothing in them worth a damn. That's the reason why they don't break down. They don't have heated, cooled seats in most cases. They don't have panoramic roofs. They don't have V8 engines. They've got those bullshit little four cylinders that put out like less than 100 horsepower. So those things really don't break down. But now, if you're talking about, say, a Hellcat, and you're looking at a 70000 loan amount, well, in my case, let me push that up. It was actually 76000 because you got to factor in the taxes, dealer fees. The monthly payment that they're showing is 983 Now, I personally know my monthly payment was actually $1,050. But the point of it is, no matter how this is said and done, especially if you're trading in another car, you're, you're probably not getting out of that dealership without having some monthly payment that comes out to about, let's say if you have 1050 because it's going to be about $1,000. So then the number of months would change to like 80 So by the time you'd finish paying that car off, that car, the total amount paid would be $83,000 by the time you finish paying it off. Now, some people are like, oh, I don't care. I don't care. I just want it. I just want it. Here's the problem, though. I know people who've gotten hit with monthly payments as high as $1,000. $300 because, you know, their credit was low or their trade-in value wasn't that high. 63 months. Now, this is over 63 months. If you're paying $1,300, yeah, you'll pay slightly less interest because the number of months has decreased. So over the loan of the loan term, you only pay $81,900. But the thing about it is what most of these dealers will do is they will push the number of months up to, let's say, 84 months, because they'll, they'll try to put you in these loans for 12 years now. They'll do 144-month car loans in some of these subprime dealers. So your monthly payment might drop to 1004 The problem is, at the end of the loan, you paid $84,353, and that's assuming you planned on keeping this thing. Here's the problem, though. They keep on making new shit. So if they keep making new shit, you think about me. I bought that Jeep, brand new, made a video about it, but I'm going to trade that son of a bitch for the Trackhawk. I don't even have 13,000 miles on that thing. So why am I saying all that? Well, the reason why I'm saying it, once again, if you're the type of person who likes brand new cars and you like the newest technology and everything, you probably don't want to buy a car that the technology is going to rapidly improve within one or two years. And that's the reason why, once again, you lease German you buy Japanese. Now, when I say lease German, it doesn't necessarily mean German. It means you lease the technologically advanced cars because after one, two, three, or four years, you can give those cars back. But if you're buying a car that you plan on keeping for the long term, that's the one that you want to finance. Because if you finance a long-term car, most likely the costs are lower in general. I mean, you think about it. The costs are usually lower. 
one of those shitty ass Honda Accords and or one of those stupid Toyota Camrys. Those things are like let's say twenty one nine nine five, and let's say that comes out to about twenty two thousand dollars. Let's say the term on that loan is about a seventy month loan, and let's keep the interest rate at three. Monthly payments only three hundred forty two dollars. So here you have a four door sedan that's twenty two thousand dollars, and the monthly payment is less than four hundred dollars. Totally not so with the Hellcat. With the Hellcat, we're going back up to $76,000. So $76,000, your monthly payment's $1,000 motherfucking $184. So here's the thing, though. Chrysler said, uh-oh, what did Chrysler say? What did Chrysler say? Chrysler's trying to keep these things off their lots. And they understand the fact that although the demand is high, the problem is these people don't have $1,000 a month to pay for one of these things. And they don't want people buying these cars, realizing they can't afford them, or realizing that they need to get these things off of their credit because they want to purchase a house. Like I told you in my last video, if you plan on buying one of these cars, you better make sure you buy your property first because Dodd-Frank will totally screw you up since their debt to income ratio, which means the amount of money that you're allowed to have in debt to your name unless the bank won't be allowed to give you a loan, is only 43%. If you have a car that costs you $1,000 a month, you're not going to be easily able to get a mortgage for 30 years because the bank is going to say, oh shit, you've got a mortgage already. You, you're driving around a freaking race car. So here's the issue. They're telling you, this is what they're telling you. They're saying you can lease one of these things for $707 a month but you've got to pay a $7,707. I love these numbers. I love these numbers. So they say, if you give us $7,700 and pay a $707 a month, we will give you a 12,000 mile lease per year. Um, uh, 12,000 miles you're allowed to drive for 36 months. So you're talking about three years. So let's go back to the loan calculator. So these bastards, what they've basically done is they're saying... Because we know this Hellcat is going to cost about $7,700, right? You pay us $7,707 and that will drop the price of the loan amount basically to about, like, let's say $69,99, right? So where in this car would have cost $76,000, let's say you have the moonroof because that adds like $1,500. We're going to drop the price to $70,000. You're going to have this thing for... 36 months and the interest rate, I don't know what the interest rate is because your credit determines your interest rate, but let's say it was 3%. Now here's the kicker though. Normally this thing at this rate right here with that loan amount, normally this thing would cost you $2,035. Here's the thing though. When you're leasing a car, you're not paying for full ownership of that car. So you're actually paying half the price of the car. So 69 divided by 2, let's say that you're paying, instead of paying that $70,000, let's say you're paying half that. So let's say you're paying $35,000 instead. You're paying about half because you're only paying for this thing for 36 months. You're not paying for 72 months. Interest rate, 3% monthly payment. Now you're down to 1017 But this is what they said. They said, no, we're going to make the lease special because we're decreasing your mileage too. So you're paying us $707 a month. So your loan amount is really somewhere less than $30,000. See, normally it would be $35,000, but this, is, this isn't a proper, um, this isn't a proper, what's it called? A, um, this isn't a proper loan calculator for a lease. This isn't a proper, this is a proper, this real, this loan calculator I used for when I was paying off my student loans, I paid off all my student loans. This loan calculator I used for my mortgage and this, that, and the other. This is really a better calculator for a mortgage, but it still does the exact same thing. So let's say that instead of paying them $70,000, you're paying them $707 for 36 months if you're able to have good credit and get that 3% interest rate. You see why I love this calculator? It's fantastic. So basically what they're doing is they are saving you the cost of depreciation because when that car does depreciate by about $20,000 after like 30,000 miles, when it does depreciate into the 50s, you can hand that car back to them and you can say, you know, 
I liked my Challenger Hellcat, but I think this time I want to get a Charger Hellcat. Or I liked my Charger Hellcat, but this time I want to get a Demon. I want to get a Demon. Yeah, I want a race car, and my kids are not going to be in the car with me, and I'm going to drive around racing shit, racing these shitty Japanese cars and Acuras and shit. I'm going to just buy a race car. You have that option because you have a lease. Now, if you finance this motherfucker, well, let's just take a look and see what Hellcats are going for. Now, mind you, it's a $70,000 car. I'll go on uh, eBay. It's a $70,000 car, but after a very short period of time, because of the fact that they're overproducing these cars right now, even after some mileage, these things are going down to about the 50s. In the 50s, they will hold their value, but I'm seeing these things between 50 and 60, so let's see uh, highest price. These things are going between 50 and 60, and you know they're not as high as 70 once they're used. But um, let's see when you say condition used. These things are decreasing in price into the lower 60s. Because you got to remember, anybody who bought these things early, they got screwed by these dealers. And the dealers ripped them off and made them pay $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 over sticker. Some people who I actually know spent $5,000 over sticker. Now, you saw the video I made. I didn't spend a dime over sticker. I told them I'm not paying that shit. I didn't spend a dime over sticker. And my 300 Chrysler, I made them take that car 100% value. I told him I'm not taking any depreciation on it. I said, listen, if you want to make this deal, you're going to take this car 100%. That's how I do because I'm Donald Trump over here. I'm the black Trump. So anyway, as I'm telling you, these things decrease into about the 50s. And they're going to stay in the 40s for a long time. And when I say a long time, these things are going to stay in the 40s for about five or six years. So right now it's 2017. It'll be like 2022 before you can get one of these things any cheaper than about $30,000. And that's even if it has a Carfax with some damage on it. As long as they repair the damage, those things are not gonna depreciate that fast. They're just not gonna do it. Because the problem is, in between them and the V6s is still the SRTs. And the SRTs depreciation is already slow. So now you got this thing right here that's got more horsepower than most Lamborghinis have. And then you go to the next tier and you got Dodge Demons and Trackhawks. So anybody who's trying to argue with me about leasing doesn't make sense, fuck you. I'm telling you right now, leasing does make a lot of sense. Now there's some people who say, oh yeah, well, you leased your car so you don't own nothing. First of all, I financed both of those cars. And I'll, I'll say it like this. The two new cars that I bought that I made the videos on, I financed those cars. The leasing cars that I do, I do for my car service between Manhattan and JFK Airport or LaGuardia. I don't make videos about all my cars because I really don't want people knowing everything that I'm doing here. And, you know, that it makes it easier when you go to your CPA and you try to disclaim people so your taxes are lower. But bottom line is this. Leasing makes sense for high-tech or high-performance cars. Now, what I will say is there is a reason why you may not want to lease. If you get caught speeding in one of these cars, which will happen, your insurance is going to damn near double. The reason why is because a lease is still not your property. It belongs to the uh, people you leased it from. If you're speeding and shit, that means that you've increased the likelihood that you're going to get into a car accident. If you live in a high population city like I do, and you're speeding, you've increased the likelihood you're going to get into an accident. If you live in a high population city like I do, you've increased the likelihood of being hit by somebody even if you're not speeding. The, the thing about insurance, which a lot of people don't understand, is insurance is a pooling of the risk. Insurance means that a bunch of people get together and they pool their money in order to certify risk. So whether it's healthcare insurance or car insurance, people who are paying into it basically are pooling risk. If you do things to prove that you're riskier than other people, your insurance goes up while everybody else's stays lower. And this is the reason why Obamacare was never going to work. It's because this country has an open border policy and a welfare state. A country cannot simultaneously have open borders and a welfare state. Because if you have people who aren't putting in as much as they're taking out, 
they are not helping to share the risk. So the amount of money that you're working from, the pool of money, constantly depreciates faster because you have some people who are not contributing as much as they're taking out. And that is the reason why I'm a Republican. That is the reason why I'm a business person. And that is the reason why I hate the welfare state and I want to see it burned down.